look at how I roll this out. I start off with something fairly innocuous. You know, rig yourself like a rogue wave is chasing us. Everyone should kind of get the gist of what she's saying with that, especially when he's like, I'm not going anywhere with you. But just to make sure, I do have her say it in English, and I'm doing air quotes for those that can't see, where she says, now get, how do you, how do you dirt sailors say it? Get dressed. So just to make sure that the readers understand that rig yourself, by saying rig yourself, she was saying get dressed. But then she goes right back into her, her own speaking. All right, so in continuing our discussion on dialogue, in the last session, we talked about uh, bad things and whatever. And I do want to kind of revisit one of those things. But before we get into there, uh, let's let's really, this this episode, let's, let's kind of sit down and really kind of break apart some examples that we think are good. And it's a little bit kind of narcissistic because we're going to read our own writing and say how good it is. So I guess I want to start off by saying we're not saying that we're the best writers in the entire world. We're saying we know why we wrote what we wrote. And so we're going to use them as an example to show you why we did it. You can agree. You can disagree. Let us know in the comments below. Um, you know, we're fine. It's subjective. We get it. So we're not saying you have to write this way. We're just going to show you how we think and how we write. And hopefully that'll help you out. Um, but let's start with um, with subtext, because uh, I think you have a really good scene uh, in uh, the Hidden Blade. I'm pretty sure it's in the Hidden Blade. Is it in the new? The... It's in. It's in the Lion Vessel, the third book. Okay, the third book. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So let me let me um, just say what I was trying to establish in the scene. So it's a it's a scene that takes place between Nahira, Tahil, and Darasaya. Now Nahira is the uh, chief priestess of the religion, and her husbands are uh, Tahil and Darasaya, who are respectively a priest of the right-hand god, the god of creation, and the priest of the left-hand god, the god of destruction. And um, when they're having this conversation, they're talking about religious matters. And I wanted to remind the reader uh, what what the attributes of the gods are and how the two men interact around those attributes. So um, I needed to do that and have them have this discussion about the conversation that they just had with somebody who isn't a part of their religion, but that has just been questioning them about the tenets of that religion. So that all happened before the scene that we started. So now I'm going to share my screen let me let me while you're doing that do you understand I, and because when you were saying that i just realized that we do need to have mm -hmm. one more caveat yes we're going to be pulling things from existing work maybe deep into them like this is from the third book mm. so don't worry if you're not following the motivations behind the characters or who the characters are or anything like that we're literally this this we're going to be talking about dialogue and so we're going to use these examples to show you examples of that so focus in on that. If you get a little confused on like, wait a minute, who is Darasaya and, and how does she have two husbands and, and what is all this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to. Yeah. She has yeah. her books available so you can go yeah. you can go get those and you can read all of them and catch all the way up and learn all this really cool stuff. So yeah. don't I just don't want you to lock in on that. I don't want you to get lost in the oh, crap. I'm thinking about all these other things and not thinking about the dialogue examples that we're talking about here. So don't worry about the story. Just worry about what we're going to kind of show you through the dialogue. Right. So we're going to start with uh, the line here, which is uh, when Darasaya says, what was that about? Asked Darasaya, Darasaya asked in temple tongue. And that is also just a cue to the reader that they're switching to a different language, one which cannot be understood if they are overheard. Actually, let's let's take a second for that. Yeah. Um, because there is... So there's 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 only a couple ways because your reader reads English. Yeah. So you, so like yes, you can do what 
um, Tolkien did, and you can spend eight years inventing a mythical language that actually works because you're a linguistics professor and have spent 50 years studying language. But it, the reality is, is that almost no one's going to read that. So when I'm reading Lord of the Rings and I hit a paragraph in Elvish and, you know, it's got all the Elvish words in it, I don't read it because it's gibberish to me. I just skip that paragraph because the next paragraph is the exact same paragraph, but now in English. So that's one way to do it. I'm not faulting um, Tolkien for doing it. Maybe I'm jealous that I can't do it, but I'm still not going to do it because to me, it just seems a waste to write stuff that no one can read. And again, yes, there are a few people out there that know how to speak English. So do not hit the comments like, I can speak Elvish. Like, okay, great. Good for you. There's three people in the world you can talk to now. Um, I'm, I, I'm picking. So that is one way. Another way is what she's done here, where you still just write everything in English. It's just the way it's written. Um, but you have a cue to make sure you allow the reader to, to say, hey, they're doing this. Um, and there's literally nothing wrong with that. This is actually probably the most common way to do it. I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to do a third way. But if you have more ways, these are the only three ways that I can think of off the top of my head. So in Genesis, one of the things that I did was there is a race that has their own language. And I'm not going to make up that language. So I needed a plot device because there is no main character that is of that race. So I made up this plot device because there is a main character within that society. He, you know, he he goes there and he's basically living amongst them as a student. And I gave him a magical device that translates their language in his head. Now, I don't use speech tags, so I could never say something like uh, Darasaya asked in temple tongue because that's a speech tag. Mm -hmm. So what I chose to do is and it caused my publisher great grief, uh, especially for the digital books, is all of their language that is converted into English, basically, is written in a script font. Yeah. So and I never explain it except for the fact that because the character doesn't know that this magical item does this. And so the, every time it does it, it turns ice cold. It's a necklace and it turns ice cold in his chest. So the first time it happens, he's like, what the crap? And because he doesn't realize they're not speaking English. So there is a there's an oddity to the character and then the character figures that out. And so that's how I teach the reader when you see this script, because obviously the character can't see the script. Um, that's my cue that that the character should not understand the words that are coming out of this character's, you know, this other character's mouth. And so that was the third way. And that's the way I did it through the Genesis saga, where it's just script. And then I can. I can think of one other way. Okay. So, so you you change the font. Right. You could change the punctuation. You could teach the, the reader that uh, when you use a square bracket, it's in a different language. Or when you use stars, it's in a different language or something like that. So you could you could use punctuation to achieve that as well, I suppose. Exactly. And we even did that yeah. in... Um... Magic Fall, Magic where we yeah. have a, a character who talks inside of another character's head. So we put the little asterisks around it to let you know that that's not being said out loud. It's only yeah. being said in this character's head from this other character. Uh, yeah. And that is a standard. You're right. That is, that's kind of a yeah. becoming a standard way to format as well. Basically, it just comes down to you don't have to invent a language <laughs> and write paragraphs of this gibberish to make the reader feel like they're seeing another language. There are other yeah. ways to go about that, either just, you know, not doing anything special with the texture or punctuation mm -hmm. and just telling the reader, hey, here's a clue. I'm just going to let you know this is not in their language. Yeah. Using punctuation to teach the reader, but then you have to teach the reader. And we did that in Magic Falls. The first time yeah. Ghost speaks, Laron is like, wait, what? Who's talking to me? What the crap's going on? Um, and so we get that. And then, you know, same thing, like I just said, when I changed the font, that was another way. But in all aspects, other than the first, uh, although in the first, it's kind of you have to teach them a language. But in all aspects, what you're doing is you're teaching the reader this special thing about your book. And then once you do that, they'll go with it. They will yeah. just be fine with it. So anyway, it was just yeah. it wasn't on the docket to talk about. But <laughs> since you had it right there, I was like, you know what? That is actually something I don't think I've ever heard anybody <laughs> talk about is how would you go about having people... Yeah. Have, teaching the reader that these things aren't being said the way 
you think they are. So that when, like, because in your scenes, sometimes when they're speaking in temple tongue, the other characters are clueless. Yes. They have no idea what's going on. And they act it, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're uncomfortable. And I mean, it's just like, you know, we've all been, or most of us have been around that time where you're with three people and everybody's friends and talking along. And then three start talking in a language that you don't speak. And you're like, mm, <laughs> well, I'm the odd man out. Um, so oh. anyway, just, that was I an interesting, I thought that I was an interesting rabbit. Many Europeans have been in that situation. I don't know how often it happens to Americans. <laughs> Um, it happens with us only really with Spanish <laughs> and I do kind of speak Spanish. So yeah. yeah. Um, but it can happen to you in America and in Europe quite often. Oh, uh, it, it, yeah. it is a thing that happens. Especially if you're an American in Europe, then it always happens. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, what was that about? Darasaya asked in Templeton. The hill dug up a handful of sand, making a hole beside the blanket. She wants to convert that one. Darasaya took some of Tahil's miniature mine dump and dribbled it to form a tower. She believes in her own power. The waves pounded onto the beach and sucked back into the surf, leaving a salty tang in the air. Nera leaned on her elbows. It won't be the first time a leader has followed the faith without belief. Those questions were certainly leading somewhere. We have a long ride to this rebel camp of theirs. Tahil extended his pit to become a moat around Darasaya's tower. I'll bet a chime to a piece he speaks to us again. We must find out more from Mikkel, Naira said. If his information is correct, this woman holds the key to a place where the followers of the gods already live in great numbers. We need her. More even than we need Alunt, Darasaya asked. Alunt is a prince about to enter rebellion. Tahil smashed the tower, ebony fists drilling the soft sand down layer by layer to form a crater. His status depends on his dukes, and we have one of them right here asking complicated questions. She is a far more powerful ally. Darasaya smoothed out the hole Tahil had made and started heaping sand again. I hope we're doing the right thing. We came here seeking the voice of the goddess. Nayira placed her hands over his, drawing him away from his destroyed construction. I know. My loves, before this, I worried that we had left the path. But we cannot forsake these people. They believe that their souls could be destroyed. How can we leave them in bondage to such an idea? The hill curled his arm over her shoulder. We are called. We will answer. Leaning into his embrace, Nayira drew Darasaya to lie beside them. The sun stroked warm lines across her skin and the waves susurrated on the sand. Light scintillated through her soa charms, the refractions a reminder that her life belonged to divinity. Quietly, she made her peace with the prophecy. Then we are committed to the hidden three. There are sire grimaced. As long as no one tells me I can't be married to the two of you. The hill's grin flashed white over their dead bodies. Um, so... What I was trying to show here, with especially with the construction from the sand perspective, right, is Tahil doing the protection, which is what he does, right? He protects by digging the moat. But then he's also an element of the god of destruction. So he literally destroys the tower, right? But Darasaya doesn't berate him for it. He doesn't feel as though this injured him because this is the nature of the gods they serve. He then starts building it again, which is their cycle. And Nayira breaks the cycle by drawing Darasaya away from his destroyed creation because she is the balance between the two powers. That is the, the role of the goddesses to balance the two powers of creation and destruction. Um, and, and then their conversation around this is all is basically still on the religion, but the actions form the basis for reminding the reader how the religion works. Yeah, so there's there's two layers of things that are going on here. 100% of the narration is they're building their power and, you know, utilizing all of that. And 100% of the dialogue is, hey, we just had this conversation with someone that could be she's actually trying to convert or it could be that she just knows that this is a way to give her an edge. Um, mm. At least that's what I took from from this. Yeah. 
So uh, you have two very distinct things going on here, but it, it still layers together all at the same time. It also does a third thing. It shows the connection between the three. You know, that there isn't a jealousy between their threesome relationship, that there's a, you know, they all understand each other's role in this relationship. So yeah. that's also in there as well. Yeah. Um, and to me, like that is the thing that dialogue needs to achieve. It needs to cement the characters and move the plot forward. Right. And which this does. But then. Why I specifically chose to highlight this in this podcast is because, like both of us believe in cutting out speech tags where we can. Obviously, I do use them, as you can see here. But much of the identification of who's talking is done through the actions. But if you can tie those actions back into the dialogue in some way or in some relevant way to the world building or something like that, then you can achieve another layer of something through the actions. Yeah. To go the other direction, I would like to get into, so in my current work of progress, I've got a race. So I'm taking a big risk with my current work in progress. I'm heavily writing accents. Mm -hmm. This is something that is a no-no. It's something that I've wanted to do my whole, whole career, but no publisher would allow me to do it. And now that I have left the industry, I can do whatever the crap I want to do. It's my game. I'll play it how I want. Um, but I've spent three years testing these accents and testing over and over and over again and going way too heavy and annoying everybody and way too light where it really didn't add anything and and trying to figure out the rules and and how to actually do it without pissing readers off and so on and so forth. However, there's... There's five plus two characters that kind of speak uniquely. So that's seven different rule sets that I had to come up with for language. So I guess I am kind of doing what Tolkien did in, in a way. But when I was working on the fifth one, I was I was stumped. I like like one of them uses yes and no, another uses no uh Nix and I, another uses I and ja, or ya and like one use one race uses no body, but the other uses no one, anybody, anyone, and all that. One uses maybe, one uses mayhap, one uses will, one uses shall. Like there's all these different things that I can do. But when I got to the fifth one, I was just like, I, I don't, I'm out. Like I don't have anything else. Like, what do I do? And I got this idea that since it was an island race, they were gonna speak gibberish. They were never going to say anything that they were talking about and that they were that everything they said was going to be an allegory, everything. And I also didn't want necessarily a pattern to it, although you will see a pattern in here that I just haven't had time to go in and try to figure something else out. And what I mean by that is they don't say yes the same way every time. They don't say, you know, whatever. I, it, everyone is it's this free flowing language that just doesn't mean anything. And, and like I said, there is. There's three times in this piece where she says true as the tides because I was just lazy and I was just like, I'll figure it out later um, because I do want to come up with two different ways to say true as the tides where you just know that she's saying that's true. Um, but I just left it in there because, you know, this is sure this is literally rise. huh? sure as the moon rise. But that's not nautical. Oh, I'm it absolutely to... is. The moon drives. The moon uh... drives the tides. True that. <laughs> believe me mariners know all about the moon they know when right. it rises they know when it sets they know all of it because the tides are so relevant to their lives yes that is 100 percent um but i'll like i said that's the only thing in here that i'm not 100 percent happy with uh this is literally a chapter i'm currently actually writing so you guys are going to see as close to my raw writing as i ever let anybody see um, this isn't fully edited. I'm not even, if we scroll down, the chapter's not even finished. So uh, this is literally the thing that I'm writing this week as we're speaking. But this is also my introduction to this. So, you know, we talk a lot about training the readers. You have to train the readers um, what what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish and so on and so forth. So let me share my screen. 
and we'll kind of get into this. So the only the, the, the couple of pieces of setup that you need from this that you already got before you got here. These are two students in a magical school. Um, it isn't like Harry Potter or anything like that. It's different. But uh, the girl that we're going to meet, which is the Islander, everyone finds her amazingly annoying. Uh, the teachers want to get rid of her. She's it's like a 10 year process to learn this stuff. So she's been here forever. Um, and the other character, the main character, the POV character, he's excelled in magic and he's actually been invited to go to this other place to, to, to train under these special mages. And so he's excited about that. And that's kind of what he's thinking about here. Uh, so I'll just start there and I'm going to read and then we'll go back and we'll kind of look at some things because you'll see how I train the readers. I'm, I'm training. This is the first time they really had access to this, uh, this island speaking, this island culture. And so you'll see how I train the reader to understand what they're going to be dealing with as they go through here. So I'll just start off here. And by the way, we are sharing all this stuff on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on podcast and you want to go back later and hit up YouTube, highly recommend that you do that so you can actually see what we're reading at the same time. So the Elmorians is where he's going. Or, you know, the people that he's going to go study under. The Elmorians themselves were an enigma. He'd read descriptions of them, but he'd never been able to find an illustration of one. It didn't matter. In less than two moons, he'd be able to see them with his own eyes. His heart sank. Two moons? Nearly six ten days in the middle of endless water. He couldn't imagine what it'd be like traveling so long without ever see setting eyes upon land. Worse, Gentra had picked on him relentlessly over the fact that he'd be seasick the entire voyage, though he, he had no idea exactly what that entailed. Puking, she said. Lots and lots of puking. She would know. She was, Sil she was Silouayan, after all. And like so many from the island nation, her family were sea traders. By her own account, she'd been birthed in the middle of the great ocean. Still, if a girl can deal with life at sea, it can't be that hard. As if summoned by his thoughts, his door burst open and the brown-skinned woman rushed into his room. Rig yourself like a rogue wave is chasing her, or is chasing you. He gave her a deadpan stare. I'm sure there ain't no reason to knock before entering a young man's bedchambers, after curfew, when girls ain't even allowed in the boys' quarters. Malant resisted the urge to pull his spare blanket over himself. While it was embarrassing to have a woman see him in his bedgown, this wasn't the first time she'd barged in on him like this. She's worse than my sister. Gentra scrunched up her face as if she'd bitten into a lemon. Believe me, there ain't no treasure in your galley I desire to behold. Her eyes went wide. Now get, how do you dirt sailors say it? Get dressed. The tide is ebbing, and we must catch the wind or we'll miss it. Shaking his head, Malant pulled his travel sack into his lap and opened it. No idea what you think we'll miss but I ain't going nowhere with you this late. In total disregard of his words, he began sifting through his shack, sack, searching for an initiate robe. Whatever crazy, whatever craziness she has in mind, she's going to make me do it whether I want her or not. They'd been... Friends was too strong a word to describe his relationship with Gentra. It was more that he was the only student at the academia with manners enough to be kind to the island woman, though the sea trader's daughter's bra brashness pushed even his good upbringing to the limits. Gentra crossed her arms. Oh, so hoisting sails for a glimpse of the lion man ain't to your fancy then, huh? Malant jerked as if she'd slapped him. The Kithian? How could we? His mouth shut with a click. He never understood how the Silouayan woman pulled things off, but Gentra had a way, had a knack for breaking the rules. He now understood the reason behind the saying, on a Silouayan's tongue, truth and tide shift just the same. Still, this would be impossible. Initiates ain't even allowed to leave the school grounds. He squinted one eye at her. And don't go trying to tell me senior initiates can leave, because I know better. True as the tides. But what I have rigged under my robe will see us sail past the gate gata. Reaching down, she grabbed the bottom of her garment and started to pull it up. Heat shot through Malant as her ankles became exposed. What in the nether plains are you doing? He spun around to face the back wall so fast his bag of belongings ended up on the floor. A giggle was his only answer. Worse, the woman's robe landed on the bed beside him. Slamming his eyes shut, he swallowed hard. Um... Are you crazy? Swing your keel, silly. Choose the tides. I'm decent. You ain't ever decent, even when fully clothed. He pulled in. This pulled another giggle out of the islander. Butterflies filled his stomach. Gentra always seemed to do the wrong thing, or perhaps the right thing, if the right thing was annoying everyone around her. 
but it was normally just in what came out of her mouth, at least as much as can be understood anyway. To say Siloans were a strange people would be an underestimate, uh, an understatement. But Gentra was something more. Not that he had much experience dealing with the island people. In fact, Gentra was the only Siloan he'd ever met. Still, he didn't think she was right in the head. But lewdness? That's going too far. A hand gripped his shoulder and tugged, attempting to pull him around. He sat defiant, but after a moment allowed himself to be rotated. He did, however, keep his eyes shut tight. For the love of the sea, mother, cast your gaze. With reluctancy, he cracked one eye open. What he saw made both his eyes pop wide. Gentra stood before him, dressed in a dark blue robe. Silver starburst lined the cuffs and hem, and embroidered over her right breast sat three, the three-sunned emblem of the Order of Shapers. What? How? The black-haired girl burst out laughing. Learnt it as the first night watch took the helm this eve. She spun, running her hands over the silken over the silken fabric that covered her from shoulders to sandaled feet. I'm a Sulak, full and true. Malak couldn't believe it. Then a thought struck. Wait, what about your graduation ceremony? The overseers claim no time to catch that wind. Time? Just when he didn't think the conversation could get stranger, Gentra found a way to do to make it do just that. What's time got to do with anything? Instead of answering him, she walked out of his bedchamber. He blinked a few times over her curtness. That woman. Before his impatience got the better of him, however, she returned carrying a large bundle. It seems the Order has chartered a prestigious mercenary troop for a very important mission. Their crew is short one healer, and the overseers feel I'm the perfect frapping to plug that leak. A wide grin split her face. They cast off with the dawn's first light. Malant had no idea what a frapping was, but the entire explanation felt suspect to him. Um, that seems... He trailed off. Even though he was a country bumpkin and still didn't feel at home here in the big city of Mockley, Gentra's inability to ferret out people's motivations made him look like a social savant. Not that she was slow, the opposite, in fact, at least with books and lessons. She simply had troubles interacting with people was all. It could simply be the difference in her people's dialect and how they relate almost everything to some nautical term or another, something that took Malant more than a moment to get used to. But he didn't think so. She seemed more awkward, and I think that's probably good enough um as far as that so that's the fifth accent of this world basically it's not an accent at all it's just random gibberish kind of but no one none of my beta readers and my critique groups or anything like that have ever lost the gist of the mm. conversation they don't have to think about it they don't have to go you know whatever but if if you look at how i roll this out i start off with something fairly innocuous you know rig yourself like a rogue wave is chasing us everyone should kind of get the gist of what she's saying with that especially when he's like i'm not going anywhere with you but just to make sure i do have her say it in english and i'm doing air quotes for those that can't see where she says now get how do you how do you dirt sailors say it get dressed so just to make sure that the readers understand that rig yourself by saying rig yourself she was saying get dressed but then she goes right back into her her own speaking but i let her get stronger and stronger and stronger in her allegories as the conversation goes until we get down to the part where like when she says um uh where is it where she says learnt it as the first night watch took the helm this eve they're not on a ship, but they like they even refer to people's own bodies as hulls or ships or whatever. Uh, your life is a ship. Like everything relates to that aspect of it. So this is the first line that is potentially there that could throw people off. Um, because there is no first night watch. There is no taking the helm. Basically, she's saying she literally just learned it. Um, you know, because this is already, again, there's been other chapters. So you you already know that, that this is nighttime from a day. You know, during the day, she was an initiate, and now she's a mage. And so that's what they're discussing. That's the significance of the robe. And again, you got that beforehand. But then, just to take it a bit further, I have the line where she says the overseers feel I'm the perfect frapping to plug that leak. Now I use that on purpose. Almost no one is going to know what a frapping is. Um, I could have used the, so 
for those that don't know, in a sailing ship back in the day, if you had a if you had a small leak, you cocked it. So I could have used that. I could have said, you know, the overseers feel I'm the perfect cock to fill that leak or cog or plug or whatever. And everybody would have gotten that. If the leak is a little bigger, then they use something called frapping, which is still caulk, but it's got like hemp rope mixed into it and bits of cloth or anything to kind of help, you know, make it more gummy and fill a bigger leak or whatever. But since I know my audience is probably not going to know what frapping is, when Malat says, I have no idea what that is, one, it connects the reader to the character because they're like, oh, I don't know what it is either. But it is also permission to not know what it is. It's is. I'm telling the reader, this word is not important. You don't need to know the definition of this. You are, you're fine. So again, it's the only thing that's real is the reader. Milan's not real. He doesn't need to know what frapping is. The reader is the only thing that's real. And so what I'm doing by that is a bunch of things. You know, first of all, I'm, I'm taking that that gibberish language up a notch to where I know you're probably not going to understand what they're saying. But then I'm also giving you permission to know that there are certain words that they're saying that really aren't where you're going to get the context of what the conversation is. The word frapping doesn't give you what it is. You know, you've got plug the leak. That's really all you should need. You know, the overseers feel I can plug the leak. You don't need to know frapping to plug the leak. So Again, it's just it's just this process of thinking about, I know what I'm doing is going to be difficult for some people, so let me mitigate that difficulty as much as possible. Let me start off easy. Let me build to it. Let me, you know, constantly train. The, that's why, you know, he has the inner monologue thoughts, well, not the, inner, the narration thoughts about to say Silhouettes were strange people was an understatement, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not only building Gentra as a character, I'm also building out these Islanders. As a, as, a, as a, you know, culture of people. So there's a lot going on here. Yeah. And yet it's still gibberish. And I think, um, I think that this is a really good demonstration of using strange idioms and expressions, which will still be clear to the reader what they're supposed to mean, you know, um, you can use, and you should, I talk about this all the time when I'm talking about world building, world building cultures and so on, mm -hmm. the importance of language, the importance of idioms that make sense in the context of the person who is talking, you know, building up your expressions, drawing on your magic system, embedding your magic system in your culture by using expressions related to your magic system, things like that. Um, and but what you have to be aware of when you're doing that is at least the first few times you need the reader to be able to pick up either from context or from somebody saying, I don't get it, you know, please explain it. Um, you need you need to like help the reader understand the terminology. And that is what you do here very easily. The one or two spots where there is hesitation on what it means, you have Malant interject, which works perfectly. Yeah. Um, but it's even like to go off your world building thing, if we go back to where I started with this now, this is chapter 10, or it will become chapter 10. So the reader has already been aware that months in this world are called moons, weeks are called 10 days. That 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 has been taught, that has been threaded through, but I'm still constantly looking for opportunities to kind of drive that home. So in the line where it says his heart's, you know, when he says in less than two moons, he'd be able to see them with his own eyes. I then take that as an opportunity to go, ah, you know what? I'm still going to pound what, because I'm still only in chapter 10. So I'm still going to pound to the reader what that means. And then that's why his heart sinks and he thinks two moons. And then the narration comes back in with nearly six, 10 days in the middle of endless water. Really, the the, the audience is going to focus on the middle of endless water. But it, it it's, again, just my way. We're still in the early parts of the book. And I'm still making sure that I'm driving home to my reader without telling them. I don't tell them that two moons, you know, that a moon is three, 10 days. I don't have to because I can use the the event that's happening within the moment to look for organic ways to do that world building without ever, you know, saying, you know, there's nowhere in this book that goes, 
a moon is six ten or is three ten days, and a ten day is ten days long. I mean, I named it ten days for a reason, um, because I didn't want to use week. And I, I will say that one of the things that I quite enjoyed doing in Lion Vessel because I have two different cultures in Lion Vessel, right? And for the yes. first time, these cultures are interacting, and and so I actually had a moment where the one character said a time unit and then went, uh, hold on. And then I was like, she counted on her fingers, converting these time units into those time units and right. then came in those time units. Yeah. And stuff like that is so fun. I mean, me and you literally live by that. Cause you know, you'll be like, you know, it's, it's two degrees here. And I'm like, ah, two degrees. What does that mean in Fahrenheit? And or I'll be like, oh yeah, no, it's freezing here. It's sixty degrees, and you're like, oh. okay, what is sixty degrees in Celsius? <laughs> like that's not freezing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's that's so real world, and mm. anytime you can do that, it makes your world feel so much more real and so much more engaging and so much more immersive. And it is the reason why I wanted to do the accents now. Um, I will let everybody in on a little secret uh, because I am still terrified of this decision that I've made. And during this rewrite, I can't tell you, especially in the beginning, how many times I would do the accent and then I would give up on it and I'd change it all. I just rip it all out and write it normal. Um, and then I would be like, but I really like the accent. And I'd go back and try it again. And, and now I'm just done. You know, I'm, I'm definitely doing it, but I do have a safety net. So, um, there's actually gonna be two versions of everything that I write. There's going to be a classic version and a cultural version. And so the cultural version is going to be the way I want it, which is with the accents. And then for those people that do, that just absolutely detest reading, you know, drop G's on the ing words and yas and tuz and all of that, I'm going to write a classic version where I just rewrite. I'm not rewriting anything really. I'm just you know, it's like we look at here where she says, rig yourself like a rogue wave is chasing. Yeah, I'll put you there because I'm not I am going to leave. I have decided that that the Silouayans mm. speech is going to stay because that's still just in English. But like yeah. when he says, uh, you know, not before entering and it's a drop G with the mm. apostrophe, I'll take that out on the classic version. Um, There are some other things that there's another race that they be ing their action verbs. So they don't say, why don't you go to the store? They say, why don't you be going to the store? Um, so they be ing the, all of their action verbs. So not all verbs, but their action verbs. Um, they're kind of a cross between a Jamaican and Japanese culture. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of pulling like, so Malat, his culture is Rorthian, and I pull from scottish and american redneck <laughs> so you know or or yeah scottish if you um, if you ever need a, another accent you can always draw on the finnish language and not have a future tense you know? so i would draw on the on the finnish accent but um i want my readers to be able to read the words <laughs> you got some big ass words we speak perfectly good English up here, but we don't have any future. <laughs> I know. Um, you have no future. Well, that's because at any moment you could freeze to death. <laughs> so um, there's just a lot. There's a lot to think about with dialogue and accents and all that. And so, like I said, that's why I've decided to do a classic version. And then anyone who gets the, the digital versions will get both. I'll just put both in every single digital version. The, if you're going to get a physical version, you have to pick which one you want because I'm not going to. I mean, this novel is 230,000 words long right now. And I've, like this chapter is being added. So it could be up to 250,000 words. I can't make a 500,000 word book. <laughs> like no one will print that. So you will get, if you're going to buy the novel, you have choices between the cultural version and the classic version. And you need to buy accordingly to what your reading taste is. Um, but I do, I would really weep if I lost a reader because of my decision to right accents um well this this section with the teaching the reader and so on um i think dovetails us nicely into the third part we want to talk about which is 
supporting the reader through complicated conversations. And now this is primarily actually I'm gonna cut you off. Yeah. Just because I have, although I'll take control later, so I guess I could do it later, but since it's right here and I have control of the share screen, last um last podcast we talked about um a piece of dialogue that was in My Name is Earl, the TV show. And it works really great. So just don't look at this and close your eyes and just imagine, you know, that the actor is up there and they're in a pool hall and he's kind of flailing his arms around a little bit. Um, they've basically been trying to help this woman out who lost her husband. And they've just found out that they that the woman didn't lose her husband. He faked his own death and he's actually in hiding from her. And that gives them a moral dilemma, especially Randy, who's a little bit slow, a little bit on the, the spectrum, a little bit... Um, mentally deficient um and so this is a line that he did and when he did it i literally stopped the the you know i was watching on netflix i stopped it i rewound it i watched it again i stopped it i rewound it i watched it again i stopped it i rewound i wrote it down i watched it again because this is a great example of the difference between the two mediums so if you close your eyes and you just kind of imagine or if you're you know listening to podcasts you don't have to but you know so he's there and he's in the pool hall and they just figured this out he's and you see him have this moral dilemma and so his line is, are you going to tell her he's alive? She thinks he's dead, but he's not. He's not dead. He's, he's living. He's alive. He's not dead like she thinks he is. Like, it's this crazy, repetitive rambling. However, for those of you on YouTube, I also wrote it in prose. And I added a little piece. Like, So it says, Randy waved his arms around like he was swatting at a swarm of attacking bees. And then it has the line of dialogue. When you read that in your head... It is the most annoying thing that you will ever read. It's horrible to read. Watching him act it out was brilliant. And this just illustrates the difference between verbal communication and written. Again, we use two different parts of our brain to consume the data. When you are listening to someone talk, you're using a completely different part of your brain than when you are reading words yourself. Very, very different. Um, I think I've told this story before of the first monk who was kind of accredited with reading in his head. Because back in the day, there was no spelling. So anyone just spelled any word any way they wanted to because everything was sounded out. Everything. Every word was just, you just kind of sounded it out. And so everything was written, read out loud. Everything. Nothing was ever read in your head. Ever. Everything was read out loud. And so there's this monk that wrote this encounter that he had with another monk where he found the monk fascinating because the monk would sit there with a book, but he wouldn't read it, but he would turn the pages. And so the monk was like, why are you just staring at a book? And the other monk was like, no, I'm, I'm reading it. It's like, no, you're not. You're just looking at it. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it in my head. And the, the monk that wrote the tale of this is like that you can't, that's impossible. And the monk that was reading was like, actually, it's enlightening because you get so many different meanings when you read it silently to yourself than when I hear someone else read it to me. And so that's kind of the first story, the oldest story. And I don't know if it happened or not, but that is accredited as the first time a human read in their head um, because it is, it's very, very different. So I just thought it was interesting. It's a little rabbit chase. Um, let me unshare my screen and give it over to you. Um, but yep. when, you know, because I write for video games, I write for movies and TV, and I also write prose, obviously. Mm. And I think it's the number one, that one aspect right there, I think is the number one reason why. So like, you know, I'm a big Kirkman fan with his Walking Dead series. I love the comic series. I love the TV show. He cannot write prose to save his life. Like his novels are just God awful. And it's because he's trying to write it like a script writer. And, and most, and, and most uh, prose writers should not try and adapt their own books. Exactly. <laughs> and I think, I think the only reason why I've been as successful as I have been is because each one I do consider a, a different language. So I, I, I hold, I don't bring any baggage with me when I went from being a prose writer, I'm very happy that I started as a prose writer because as a prose writer, you're responsible for everything. You are the set, the director, the 
cast the you know the actors the literally everything and as a script writer you're just the words that are coming out of the actor's mouths and nothing more and so it's it's so like i always feel like i'm on vacation when i'm writing a script because it's like wait i don't have to worry about what things look like and how people are moving and like the inner emotions and like all this massive things that you have to to kind of put into your prose i don't have to do so anyway, just kind of wanted to go down that rabbit hole to kind of dovetail from last episode, just to put a exclamation yep. point on that aspect. Um, now let's get into this because I this is awesome. I love, I love this right here where you knew that this is a very complicated kind of topic and you didn't want to lose a reader, and so you kind of gave them a safety net, or or you almost gave them a mentor character that's mentoring them. That's exactly what I did. So this is, it's a scene in, in Magic Fall book two or Skies of Destiny book two, the, the book we're writing together, the series we're writing together. And um, this is this is very alpha draft, so yeah. be aware of that. But yeah. um, the, the setup for this conversation is Lyran's been trying to get into like the equivalent of university. Um, well, the like a, a, a post, post-engineering department. And he um he got knifed right his his assignment got changed and he yeah, figured knifed that as out in, knifed as in he got railroaded not actually railroaded. with a knife yeah, yeah not not literally he's he, he metaphorically knifed right. <laughs> um and and um he he ended up so so he's like okay now i need to figure out what to do i need to get this fixed and he thinks that okay you know, he knows somebody who's really good at politics, Myra. He owes her a favor from last time, which he didn't pay her for. But, you know, he's pretty sure he can figure something out. So he rushes off to go see her. Um, and he comes into the estate and so on. And during the process of coming into the estate, he learns that she's expecting him, which is already like kind of a warning sign. All right. Lyron, she lingered over his name and his knees went weak. Join me for a bite to eat. He stumbled onto the bench opposite her. her. Hi. I'm glad you finally remembered me. Her eyes danced like wicked stars. You've been back nearly two weeks. I, yes. Lyron gulped and closed his hand around a glass filled with sparkling soda and ice. The cold spot in his palm brought him a few notches closer to reality. I'm sorry I didn't come right away. Are you? And then here is where Ghost comes in. So for those of you who don't know, Ghost is a what amounts to an artificial intelligence that lives in Lyran's screen. And when Ghost is talking to Lyran mentally, it is marked with asterisks. Yeah, this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, where yeah. it's just a different, and it's also italicized, you'll notice. We decided yeah. to do both. Yeah. So Ghost says, say yes. It is unfortunate that my actions seem to have made us adversaries. And Lyran says, what? And Ghost says, say, it. now what I'm doing here is Lyran is the reader stand in, right? The reader doesn't know as much about the context of the world and these characters as, you know, anybody else does. Lyran is the same. He is not politically competent, but so, Ghost is. So we so, call we call that character an anchor character. An anchor character yeah. is a character who doesn't know things. And so they have to ask questions. What is that? How does that work? Who is that? And again, it's not for them. They're not real. They don't need to know who is that and what is that and how does that work? The reader needs to know who is that, what is that and how does that work? And that's why the farm boy trope is so overused in fantasy because what better way to teach you an entire world that you have never been in that doesn't exist, that has completely new physics and magic and politics and religion than with a farm boy who's never left the farm. <laughs> Okay, so uh, stumbling a little, Lyron repeated the line. Oh, and I just want to say here, you will notice that I don't actually repeat the line. Right. Because, dear God, important. don't do that. <laughs> it, it goes back to the what I was, when I brought the uh, Randy example in. That's yeah. exactly the same thing. Yeah. When on, if it was a movie yeah. and we were doing the voiceover and we had trained the audience that when this is said, we know it's said in their house or in their head. Um. In the movie, they might actually do it. You know, it might be, 
you know, let maybe we put an echo reverb or whatever. And so you yeah. know that we've trained you that that means that that's ghost talking in his head. And so we hear the echo reverb that says, say yes, it isn't. It, it was it is unfortunate that my actions seem to have made us adversaries yeah. and then he would think what and then he would you know again say it hmm. more than likely because we'd want to see that interaction that that nervousness that stumbling over the lines we'd want to see the character actually do that so he would go yeah um i guess i'm sorry that uh that what I did, like, because he wouldn't say it exactly the yeah. same, so on and so forth. That's perfectly fine in a visual medium. You do it here. Now, there is an argument, like, could you do it once here? Absolutely. It would not piss the reader off if we, instead of writing stumbling, stumbling a little, Lyron repeated the line here, if we actually did do it here. There's an argument for both ways. However, if you do it through the entire conversation, you will literally just piss the readers off. Whereas yeah. you could do it in a visual medium. So, sorry. Yeah, 100%. Um, and we'll get to some spots where he comes close to repeating the line. But, okay, so, stumbling a little, Lyron repeated the line. Myra ran her finger along the rim of her cup, her smile turning coy. There are those hidden depths, I remember. I wondered how long it would take you to realize what happened. You continue to surprise. Wait, she hacked my assignment? Now, this is again mentally in his head. And then Ghost replies, or leaned on the Dean, or had Verak do something, yes. And she wants you to know it. Focus. Ask, how do I fix this? But she hurt me. Why am I fixing it? Politics is a game of chess. Set aside your ego and ask her. So again, there's like, this is what is going on. This is the implications of what has been said. So And then... The yep. funny thing is, is what this is, <laughs> is the exact opposite of subtext. Yes. So if we wanted to just let the reader, because remember, this is YA. But if we mm -hmm. wanted to force the reader to have to figure out this stuff, then you take Ghost out of the equation and you let Laron bumble through it, trying to figure out. And, and he says stupid things and he gets himself into whatever, you know, he gets himself into because he doesn't really realize what's going on. But if the reader is savvy, they understand that the chick is very, very savvy in what she's doing and very meticulous and very methodical in how she dealt with this situation. Yeah. So that's that would be subtext. The opposite yeah. of that is to have a mentor inside the character's head saying, <laughs> hey, let me, let me kind of spell out what's going on here. In my epic fantasy, uh, in, in Sangwell Chronicles, the one that I read from in the first one, right? Mm -hmm. I do not give you any of this. <laughs> when you read the politics, God help you, you're on your own. Yep. <laughs> yep. I will give it's you a all couple subtext. of hints and clues to make sure I don't completely lose you. But otherwise, you need to understand the symbology, the houses, the people, the characters, and how they're talking to each other. Like, yep. good luck. Um, yeah. but, but that is an epic fantasy. The fan base for epic fantasy are people who enjoy that kind of world building, that kind of writing. They don't expect to be baby babied. Well, and just I do want to kind of expand upon that. Yeah. Um, there are circles within epic fantasy, yeah. but she's 100 percent right. There are there is a circle within epic fantasy that loves the deep political intrigue mm -hmm. because I'm not there. I mean, I don't mind any of the stuff that you've done and I follow it. Um, but if I didn't have a relationship with you, would I pick up Sangwell Chronicles? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on who recommended it. But because I love everything else, I love, you know, like the magic and the action and the, the what's going on and the conflicts that everybody's dealing with. But I'd probably because I did the same thing with Game of Thrones. I just glossed over the politics side of it because that's just not my thing, even though I'm an epic yeah. fantasy fan. So there's a market yeah. out there is basically what I'm saying. What if you're very into the heavy politics and that's what you like, um, you're going to find a market for that because there are fans that crave that. If you I mean. The first book of the Genesis saga was called Farmers and Mercenaries. <laughs> like, we're not talking about kings and princes and, you know, political intrigue here. We're talking about literally salt of the earth, just roll mm. up your sleeves and get stuff done. And, and actually, that's the basis of that saga. That's what I wanted to do. I, I was tired of the trope of every fantasy. I'm dealing with kings and queens and princes. And like, I don't want to deal with that. I want to know, you know, I want to explore a world where, just some average Joes 
literally kind of end up in a position where it's like, oh, crap, if we don't do something, everyone dies. So not no prophecy, no chosen ones, no nothing. Um, so, again, it's a rabbit chase, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands you need to understand that you're writing for a specific audience yeah. and you can't be everything to everyone. You know, she doesn't try to do this in Sangrul because that's she, for, for the Sangrul Chronicles. She's writing for a certain audience. But here in Magic Falls, we're writing for a different audience. And so we're going to we're going to target them and give them what we feel that they're looking for. And it is this very, very important if you're going to be a professional writer and be successful at this. You either need to pick one circle that you write for for the rest of your life, or if you do want to branch out, you do have to understand that you can't treat a different audience the same way as you treat, you know, your original audience or whatever. They're going to be different. I have critiquers. I have people who read only Sangwheel and who say that they really can't get into Magic Fall. I have people who have read Magic Fall and tried Sangwheel and said, I just, I can't. Yeah. Right, because they are very different in that aspect. Magic Fall is aimed at a young adult science fiction audience. Uh, Sangwheel is aimed at an epic fantasy adult audience. Also, a hardcore epic fantasy. I mean, it's yeah. there's some really really good stuff in there if you're if you're yeah. really into that the more hardcore stuff. Yeah. Um, if, so. if you like George R. R. Martin, um, if you like um, Drake's work, if you like Robert Jordan, you'll like Sangwill Chronicles. But yeah. that's the 100%. audience. And like I said, the only real difference is, is that she leans a little harder into politics than I do. Um, and I lean yeah. a little bit harder into the dude who tills the earth. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yeah. it, but that's it. It's just, I'm, it's I'm still getting to the this... dude who tills the earth, but it's, it's, it's some ways down the road. <laughs> right. Anyway. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's we're still both basically targeting the same audiences. We're just leaning yeah. on different aspects of the world uh, yeah. to tell our stories. That's really right. the difference. So, um, so we were here. Set aside your your uh, ego and Oscar. So somehow Lyron got the words out. I'm so glad you asked. Myra chose a tiny skewer of cheese, olives, and a pickled onion from a plate of dainties. You could start by fulfilling your promise to me. What did you find on the nutty fall? With Ghost's help, Lyra navigated his way through another retelling of his adventures. He told her about the quantum server and the Gliminals, but hid the information on the adapted, revealing only that he had found an AI guarding the nutty and blown it up. My, my, quite the heroic act. Myra patted her lips with a serviette, the tip of her tongue, touching the corners of her mouth. Lyron swallowed hard. It was just what had to be done. At Ghost's prompting, he added more. And now I, I need to be in anti-grav, Myra. It's not just a whim. There's more at stake. Is there now? And how is that? I learned things in that server room. He looked away from her, Buri's face rising in his memories. His unruly body calmed down. It, is a, it, it was only two days, but still, I have practical experience with the technology the anti-grav is built on. How many engineers can say that? Not many, I'll grant you that. She made a tiny sandwich with a square of bread and a hard cheese slice, handing it to Lyron. And then Ghost tells him, eat it. He ate the dainty snack with his eyes on Myra, barely tasting the sharp, sharp cheese. <clears throat> For everyone's sake, I should be an anti-grav. Will you let me do my part? Yeah, so what I was doing here as well is like she is giving him a gift by accepting it. He's saying that he's open to it, or at least that's what Ghost is doing. But I don't actually tell the reader that because at this point, I'm like, you either get it or you, or you right. that piece of subtext passes you by. Right. Um, <laughs> um, her brows drew elegant arches. Well, that is an interesting play. Do you know what our fathers are doing today? Lyron stared at her, his mind as blanked as a wiped sleeve. He'd only seen his father, he'd, he'd barely seen his father in the past 10 days. No, I thought not. They're calling a vote of no confidence in the director. She checked her sleeve. In fact, they should be done already. My father is probably the new director with your father as his speaker. All humor drained from her eyes, leaving them cool and determined. The city will change, and I intend to be a part of that change. You can help me. 
or you can rot in air filtration. Are you willing to work with her? Ghost asks. I guess so. And then Ghost says, in or out, Lyran. If you ally with her now and fail her again, she will not take it well. Lyran sucked in his breath, the perfume of the speaker. No, the perfume of the director's daughter filling his airways. In. He's thinking at Ghost. And then Ghost says, tell her you will not be a pawn like Verok. You are either partners or you are out. What does she have to do with Verok? Perhaps nothing. Her reaction will tell us more. I won't be like Verok. Lyran made his voice as firm as he, as he could. We're partners or nothing. And notice here, I do repeat the words, but I change them slightly for the impact that's required here. Mm -hmm. Myra's silvery laugh filled the arbor. I'd expected nothing less. Lyran sat forward on the wooden bench. Then you'll fix my assignment? Yes. She reached across the table and put her hand over his. But remember this moment, Lyran. You've tested me. I've responded. Let's not repeat this dance. Yeah, so I think that's enough for, for this piece. Yeah. So there's, so, before yeah. we get into it, I do want to go, there's one really, really interesting thing that you did here that I, I really do want to point out. Let's go up to line 60. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I love past tense verbs versus, you know, past using past tense instead of mm. present tense. This comes down to, let me get a little English geeky here, but it comes down to verb forms. When you're writing in present tense, you have access to present tense verb forms. Yes, you can use past tense, but now you're just breaking what you are trying to do because you're just doing this weird flashback and you're you're breaking the I'm in present tense you know moment of time. When you're in writing in past tense, you actually have access to all four different types of verb forms, which is future tense, present tense, past tense, and past perfect tense, which happens before the past tense. So you have these four layers of verbs that you have the ability to manipulate time with. And so when you run into a situation like what happens here, where I am, I need to have a character tell another character something that the readers lived through, like period. So when the character, when the when uh, the female says, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm terrible with my own names. When Myra says, um, you could start by filling, fulfilling your promise. What did you find on Nanae Paul? That's in the moment. We are, we are now of the story. But we're not going to tell the reader what they, literally, that's literally book one. Like, we're not going to just tell them that. And so now we can speed up time. And just go with with ghost help. Laron navigated his way through another retelling of the adventures. Boom! Reader gets it. Everybody understands. Is it tell? Absolutely, because it needs to be. And then once that's done, and and then also we do bring up, and I say we, um, Marie brought up because she wrote this. Um, the key elements that we need the reader to remember, um, or even what he didn't tell her so like he hid this that and the other thing or whatever um and then after one short four line paragraph of of speeding up time we slow back down to the moment my my quite the heroic act and now we're right back and so the transitions are flawless we the reader is never thrown out they don't realize that they just went from you know, watching a movie to watching a movie in fast speed to watching a movie. It, it, it's just, this is what past tense gives you. And so I just want to take that moment to to chase that rabbit because this is so awesomely done. Yeah. Um, and it is very important that you summarize things that the reader absolutely is going to know. I have already done touches of recaps in earlier chapters in this book because it is book two, so you have to remind the reader of what went before and so on. That's fine. All of that's been done. But we are now, I think this is chapter seven. There's no need to cover the same ground again. We've It's covered. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, and then the... The... He part here, the reason why I repeat this line, right, is because I because I want the emphasis of how he says it. 
and how she interacts with that line. And that's why I didn't repeat, I didn't have him repeat his lines anywhere else, including like the first one. I thought I could do it in the first one, but I I wanted it here. I wanted it at this line. And I didn't want the reader to already be annoyed by having to read double lines where it wasn't important. So but, I saved the repetition for this moment. But I also want to point out, um, going past that, as the reader, when on line 99, where, you know, so we repeated, we have, um, you know, tell her that you won't be a pawn, blah, blah, blah. And then we have, you know, so that's Ghost telling him what to say. And then we have Laron actually saying it. That's also a great transition to now Laron just kind of takes over the conversation. But as the reader, you now can assume that he's saying that after he's told what to say. And so we've even transitioned away now it's not a we don't know that for a fact because it's not in there it could be Laron taking over and actually doing it but it could be that he's repeating what ghost is telling him to repeat but because of that transition the reader will still follow the fact and the reason why i say this because these lines are are really easy so mm -hmm. Laron could easily be the one that said this but let's say we wanted to transition and we wanted to keep the hardcore politics stuff going that would be and he and Laron said stuff that were very out of character for Laron just like mm -hmm. above where he says things that are very out of character for Laron you could now roll into that completely cut ghost from the equation and the audience would know yeah ghost is telling him to say that and now i'm just watching Laron say the repeat yeah. So that's also a great thing. And again, it all comes down to training the reader. So we train the reader. Hey, look, Ghost is telling him this stuff, but I'm not going to, I don't need you to hear the repeating. We then go into this moment where Ghost says it and he repeats it. And then we can continue the conversation. And again, probably these are Laron's words and a lot of people are going to get that. But my point is we could continue to say things that we know Laron could not have discovered. And we never mentioned Ghost again. Because the audience has now been trained. This is where Laron is getting the information from. And this is why he's saying stuff out of context and out of character. Not context, but out of character. And um, the reader would just go right with it. And then that gets you more in the moment. You don't have to do this whole back and forth of getting yeah. the reader to know that Ghost is the one telling him this. It's all about training. It's all about just making sure the reader can follow the flow and, and fall into the story. The one other thing I want to highlight before we go to your your emotional scene is just in terms of, and this isn't dialogue specifically, but the way that I describe Myra here, like she patted her lips with a serviette, the tip of her tongue touching the corners of her mouth. Like that kind of description is there, not because I want the reader to be thinking about like a chick's tongue, you know, but because that is how I want the reader to understand how Lyron is feeling about it. She is making him hot under the collar because she is pretty. She's paying attention to him, you know. But it's even more than that. It also shows that she's purposefully yes. tantalizing. She's, she's She is doing this on purpose. She is literally using her beauty as a weapon against yeah. him. Yeah, she's not accidentally just going, you know, giggle, giggle. Yeah. And I'll, you know, yes, I have big breasts, but you don't need, you know, whatever. She's not, she knows, because again, it's just yeah. showing how politically savvy yeah. she is because of the world that she grew up in. Yeah. Um, and, and that's also like just part of the description of things that you put in. When you're, describe, when you're describing the actions around dialogue, when you're using that paragraph structure to tell the reader, don't forget that you are describing these things from somebody's point of view. How is that somebody noticing stuff? That is important. Yeah. Um, and it also, you know, we talk about all the time about dialogue and secondary and tertiary characters. The only way to show the character of the secondary and tertiary characters, the motivation of the character, or the motivation of the secondary and tertiary characters, the drives of the of the secondary and tertiary characters is by what they say and what they do. And so having her literally say, I'm going to be a part of this. We know Myra's motivation. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like a tell because it's a part of dialogue. And dialogue is active and, you know, it's people discussing things and everything like that. And so we get 
through subtext, we get that she's very savvy in how she plays the fact that she's very pretty. And then she's also very ambitious and driven by the words that come out of her mouth. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so we don't is... need, and we don't need Ghost to say, wow, you better watch this one. She's using her beauty against you and she's very, you know, driven to power. We don't need yeah. to say anything. We show you it. You don't need to be that heavy handed with a mentor. Like right. <laughs> anybody should be able to pick that up. <laughs> Well, even if the ghost wasn't there, uh, a writer might fall into the trap of um, Laron realized he needed to keep an eye on her because not only was she using her beauty against him, she obviously had a lust for power. Like, they'll do that. And you don't need to. It's it's there. Um, and then the argument against that would be, because, you know, I like to steal man things. Um, yeah, but what if you lose a reader? Okay, and, and I agree with that, but my, and I say this all the time, if you're not smart enough to follow what I'm doing, then you probably are not smart enough to read me. There's other authors out there that will baby you a little bit more than I will, or a little bit more than Marie will. And actually, I baby you a little bit more than Marie will. So um, we talk about that all the time. But I give you nothing. <laughs> give you nothing. Yeah, her, her fourth book is going to come out, and it's literally going to be 250 pages of blank pages, and you literally have to figure it out from there. <laughs> I, give uh, you no. <laughs> <laughs> I just of course yeah. all right yeah no some really good stuff there all right so the last thing that we're going to look at is one of my more emotional scenes um now i don't admit this very often um but do know that i'm on hormone therapy because my body doesn't make hormones anymore and even more, the radiation therapy, ther therapy killed my thyroid, and we're still trying to get that balanced out. So if I start crying like a little baby, don't pick on me. It's a sad scene to me. It might not be a sad scene to you, but it's, I was reading it to Marie earlier, and I had to actually stop a couple of times to try to make sure I didn't lose it. Um, so I'm not saying it's that sad. I'm just saying that my emotions are literally all over the place right now. Um, where is? I'm lost. There it is. Yeah, Marie won't won't cry at this at all. She won't even shed a tear. Um, oh, you don't know me. I I, I can cry in books <laughs> like a little baby child. I'm not even ashamed of it. Oh yeah, I'm not ashamed of it either. I mean, like <laughs> that kids movie that I wrote that's won a bunch of awards that I sold for a third time in December. Um, I have never, uh, there's not a single edit that I've ever gotten through that uh, and gotten all the way to the end without bawling my eyes out. I just can't. It's it's very touching. All right. So this is still, again, from my current work in progress. So we're following a POV character named Clytus Rillian. Uh, he's a jaded mercenary. He His son is dying. Um, and so his entire quest is he's going on a kind of a reckless adventure to procure something that's the only thing that could even give his son a chance of a long life but the reality is, is he's making decisions that are dumb and he knows it and it's not that they're dumb decisions they're just he is making the decision to put himself into harm's way because he all he cares about is saving his child on top of that there is an evil priesthood that has been hunting him down for years that just found out where he is and have now tried to kill him this night. So this is later in the night when he just barely made it home alive and he had a dagger in his shoulder and a crossbow in his hip and, you know, all this other stuff. So he's just gotten healed with some magic healing stuff. Um, but now he's got to go in and he was hoping his wife would just be asleep because it's way late at night. But that isn't the case. And so now he has to navigate through two kind of conversations. One, avoiding her knowing that he was in danger and how close he actually came to death tonight because he doesn't want to burden her with that. And then also explain to her that you can't stay here anymore in our lovely home, in this lovely city that we've had for 10 years. Um and obviously she's known this because she's married to the man and she knows the secret war that he's in and all this other stuff. 
So there's a lot going on, and that's what you would know coming into this scene. But this is the first time you've met his wife and his child. So I'm just going to read the whole scene, and then we'll just talk about a couple little things, and then we'll be done. Okay. So it's the start of a, a scene. He's he's gotten healed, um, and now he was in the stable when they healed him, because um, I like that's the last line um, where his best friend says uh, he looks at the knife that he just pulled from his shoulder, and he's like sharp. He nodded his approval before shifting his eyes to Clytus. This be getting the job done. I be thinking. His gaze became hard. Worry swelled inside Clytus. Get what job done? Lie on your belly and no be giving me no fuss. A wicked grin split his lip. I still be needing to get that bolt out of your ass. So he's obviously been through a little bit of medical interventions before we start here. So now we're just jumping in time to the next scene. Hair still dripping cold water from his impromptu bath in the horse trough. Clytus took the stairs leading into his villa two at a time. He carried the bonding stone he won earlier that eve, bouncing in his palm. The stone clinked against the one embedded in his own hand. He was shirtless and wearing a pair of knee breeches they found in the stables, three sizes too large. The garment looked more like full-length trousers on him, but compared to what Ragnar had just done, it was the least embarrassing thing that had happened to Clytus since he returned home, since his return home. While there was no longer any pain, his brain told him he should be limping. The Ulat repaired the damage, even the nick in his ear. But Ragnar had been none too gentle in the removing of the barbed flechette from Clytus's hip. The man, the man found too much pleasure in that by half. The villa sat dark, and Clytus slipped in without a sound. His stomach grumbled, reminding him that he had not eaten since half meal, not to mention the toll the Ulant took on his body. He contemplated grabbing something from the kitchen, but dismissed the idea. There were more pressing matters to attend to. He headed up the stairs to the living quarters. Reaching the doorway to his son's dark room, he peered inside. The shutters stood open, allowing the chilly night breeze to enter. In the dim silver glow of the waning moon, Clytus made his way to his son's sleeping form. After his eyes adjusted, he crept like the breath of a mouth into the chamber. Standing beside the bed, he gazed down at the boy, drinking in the sight. The silky black hair covering the child's head, matching his own, lay tussled from sleep. The boyishly round appearance of his face, so prevalent in children his age, peeked out above the covers. Clytus knelt and cupped the boy's cheek with cheeks with gentle, loving hands. Clytus, uh, Cyril Rillian's eyes fluttered open. Father, I wanted to wait up for you, but mother said I needed my rest. The boy blurted out the words, though he was not fully awake. Shh. Smiling, Clytus kept his tone to a whisper. I would not have you sleep this eve away without tucking you in and kissing you goodnight. His son sat up, the covers pooling around his thin waist. Did you attend the games, father? The young boy wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. It's <laughs> amazing how fast a child wakes from sleep. Leaning over, Clytus pressed a soft kiss against Cyril's forehead. That I did, my little bit. He stroked the sun, his son's glossy black hair. But it is late, and your mother is correct. You need your sleep. A gentle cough racked Cly Cyril's slight frame, and Clytus enveloped the boy as it grew in severity. Once the coughing subsided, Cyril pushed from Clytus's chest and stared into his eyes. Do you promise to tell me of the games in the morn? Clytus's heart broke. With the blood priest making the move, his plans had changed. He no longer had the luxury of spending one final morn with his son, regaling tales of the Colosseum. I can sleep on the road. He pursed his lips. If you promise not to tell your mother, I think we can spend some time now. The boy's face lit up, and he nodded. I promise. With a, with the smile on Clytus's face was warm and genuine as he began telling his son an abbreviated version of the day's events. By the time he came to the part of the lion man's exit, Cyril was stifling a yawn with the back of his tiny hand. I want to grow up and be a mighty warrior like the kith. Holding up his hand, he mimicked a claw. No one will be able to stand against me. Clytus laughed. You will look silly with all that fur. Cyril giggled and hugged his father. I will miss you, father, and I you, my little bit. Pulling back, Clytus looked up into his, or sorry, Cyril looked up into his father's eyes. How long will you be gone? Clytus placed his hand on the boy's shoulders. This will be my longest trip to date. You must be brave for me while I'm away and take care of your mother. For you and she are going on a trip as well. The boy sat up straighter. A trip? Where? Never mind that. 
The night is but half gone, and there is still sleep that needs doing. When you return, will you teach me the sword? Clytus fought the tears, welling in his eyes. Once you are feeling better, I will teach you all I know. Hush now, my little bit. It is time you were back to sleep. Clytus nestled his son's head into the pillow and pulled the silken sheets up, tucking him or tucking them under the boy's chin. Very well, father. I expect to hear more about the battles with the lion man in the morn. Cyril stifled another yawn. Yes, my little bit. I will spare you the detail. I will spare you no detail, only if you get back to sleep this instant. Clytus brushed his fingers over the boy's brow. Close your eyes. He stayed, kneeling next to the bed, stroking his son's forehead, etching every smooth curve of the boy, etching every smooth curve of the boy's features into into memory. He remained long after Cyril's breathing became deep and regular. Even more amazing is how fast they fall asleep. Lost in thought, he failed to hear the soft footsteps approaching from behind. Ragnar has left a tray of meats and fruits in your in, for you in our chamber. The soft flutter of Lilace Rillian's voice caressed Clytus' ears. Her hands did the same to his bare shoulders and chest. I fear he babies you too much. Her statement pulled a mirthless grunt from Clytus. Palming the bonding stone, he slipped into his pocket with a, as little movement as needed. We have, we have seen much, him and I. He is the best lieutenant I could wish for, he snorted. As fierce in battle as he is in keeping me happy. A wife could get jealous. The lace chide was soft and warm. It is late, my love. What kept you? Looking up, her face brought a smile to his lips. Smooth porcelain skin covered high cheekbones that accentuated her beautiful half-moon-shaped eyes. Nothing of note, my love. Just some final details for my journey. He regretted the lie, but could not bring himself to add worry to her mind. The news of where he intended to send her and Cyril would be enough for her to know the situation was dire. The encounter with the butcher was done, and he still drew breath. There would be no benefit in mentioning it in him. She tissed, or she, yeah, she tissed. Should I even ask about what you are wearing? No. He shook his head, his eyes pleading with her to abandon this line of inquiry. She sighed a sigh that said, fine, I shall not pry. Clytus reached up and held her hand to his shoulder. When she started toward the door, he let it slip from his grasp. Turning, he watched her slender form sway under the nightgown as she left their son's room. Returning his attention to the boy, he stayed for a few moments longer. Reluctantly, he rose and followed his wife. Entering their private chambers, he went straight to the side table where a silver tray, where a silver platter waited, piled high with food. Food and sleep, that is all I need. He poured himself a glass of honey wine and sat on the edge of the bed. Lelace slipped onto the bed behind him, wrapping her slender legs around his waist and pressing herself against his back. Her warm, her warmth seeping into his bare skin. Reaching over, she plucked a grape from his plate and popped it into her mouth. Biting it in half, she let its juices dribble past her lips to land on the spot that not an arm gone had been penetrated by cold steel. She bent and licked the juice from his skin. Clytus Coles closed his eyes and surrendered to the sensation of her hot mouth and nibbling teeth. She shifted around to sit in his lap, finding his lip with hers. Retur he returned her kiss like a drowning man, tasting his last gulp of air. As they embraced, the hunger of his stomach was forgotten, replaced by a different craving. And I don't write sex, so the next line is, after their lovemaking, <laughs> after their lovemaking, they lay in each other's arms, Clytus staring at the dark ceiling, content in his wife's embrace. Time passed without meaning, but all things must end, and time will not wait for the likes of me. He steeled himself for what he needed to do. I am sending you and Cyril with Ragnar to Ben Setsu on the morrow. He kept it, he kept a casual tone, trying to make it sound normal. Lelace's body stiffened, and he realized he should not have spoken at all. Why did I not wait to tell her this in the morn? I am a fool. She rose to her elbows and looked deep in his eyes. The pain and fear storming in her gaze sent agony ripping through Clytus's very soul. He stared back, his eyes begging her not to, pr to pr pursue the questions he knew raged inside her mind. Without a word, she laid back down, burying her head into his chest. Her body tensed and pulsed, tears flowing in unspoken anguish. Embracing her as tight as he could, as if by sheer strength alone he could save her from the burdens of being the wife of someone like him, 
He searched for any words that might release her from her misery. He found none. In time, her body relaxed her, and her breathing fell into a rhythmic pace. He held her for a long time, caressing her dark hair and drinking the fragrance it held. I am so sorry, my love, but I am who I am. And that's it. Yeah. And I so, think what what is shown really well in this piece of dialogue is the intensity of um, the feelings that are communicated in between the dialogue and how you can use that to control the pace. So the, the funny thing about this is the audience does not know yet why the, I mean, they know that Clytus is sending his family away because him and Ragnar have already had that conversation in the last scene where Ragnar's like, where Clytus tells him, you can't go with me because the original plan was Ragnar would always go with him on any adventures that he went on. And he's like, you must take my wife to Pensetsu. But this is the first time you've heard the word Pensetsu. You don't know what that implies. You don't know. You know he's a warrior in a secret war, but the only thing you know about the secret war is that it's secret. <laughs> and, you know, that's really it. You know, they're a special type of mage. So you don't really, as the reader, you've never learned how this would impact his life how they live with it, nothing like that. So what I wanted to show with this scene is I want to show the reaction without any information at all. And I think it's powerful. And, you know, again, everything's subjective. So you can disagree with me. You can tell me in the comments if you liked it or disliked it. But the for me, what I wanted to do was without you having any knowledge of what the ramifications truly mean, I wanted to show somebody suffering knowing that this was about to happen and you feel that pain and nothing else yeah yeah and i think like it's very important when you're doing this kind of emotional dialogue that you have to break up the pace of the words you have to control the pace you have to slow the reader down and let them almost wallow in the emotions because the reader needs that intensity. Otherwise, it's just words. It's just right. words being spoken. You, you, When you come to the sort of emotional dialogue, you really need to plunge into it. And also, it's the first time, you know, you know he's got a dying son, but this mm. is his first time coming home. Because it starts yeah. off that morning, and he's, he's away. He's getting ready for this trip. And then on his way home, he gets ambushed and almost yeah. killed by the butcher and so this is that time where i really wanted to allow the reader to fall in love with the relationship that clitus has with his son hmm. um so that you understand so that you care about whether clitus succeeds or not on this adventure that he's about to go on this undertaking to to gather this rare ingredient that the healers might possibly be able to use to save his son's life yeah. Um, it's just allowing you to understand because this whole time you've been following Clytus and he's preparing for this trip. And, you know, of course, the priest attacking him was not he, what he was hoping for, especially at this moment, since he's leaving tomorrow. Um, and when so this using when you're using a child or some other family member as the driving motivation for a character. You have to show that that character cares about that thing at least once. Yeah. And the best way to do that is with direct interaction like this. Yeah. Because also this is the the only time. Because tomorrow morning, yeah. Clytus leaves the city. Yeah. And like that's <laughs> so you've it. Got one, you've got one scene to sell the reader on this. This man is driven by the love of his son. Um, and his wife. I mean, it's, yeah, and his wife, he's, but he's but a family but, man, family yeah, is the but most he's, but he's go, he's man. going on he's going on this quest because of love of his son. Yeah, um, and and therefore it's very important that that this scene plays out with all of those emotions, and at the slower pace, so that the reader really draws it in. You know, it's so funny. Um, one of the readers last night in the writers' room for the critique group, um. She has a scene where she has like seven characters mm. and she finished reading it and she was like, all right, 
I need feedback. But what I don't want to hear from you people is I have to cut some characters because they all have to be there. And it was very confusing. It was a very confusing scene. And the funny thing is, and people do not get this advice very often. And so when I said it, everyone in the room was like dumbfounded. But I said, to fix the scene is very simple. You need to slow it down. And so it's funny that you're saying this is why this works so much is because I did absolutely slow this down to a crawl so that the readers could experience every single moment of every single aspect of what's going on um, and have time to consume it and have time to, you know, literally incorporate it into their understanding of these characters in this world, in this moment and everything like that. I don't on think people understand circle. the power of slowing it down um, enough. On, on, on Critique Circle, I don't say it often, but I have done it like five or six times where I've said, the scene is too fast. Yeah. Slow it. And I know, and normally it's with world building more than emotional scenes. Um, although I do say it sometimes with emotional scenes. But with world building, you cannot throw five names at the reader and expect them to absorb it. Yeah. It is not going to happen. You need to slow it down. You need to give them time to absorb it. You need to give them a practical e exposure to the thing you're introducing them to. Slow it down. And that's such a juxtaposition to the normal, be efficient, cut words that you don't need, that don't do anything. <laughs> drive the plot, drive the story. All of those are right in those contexts but yep. there are just things i mean like you know we pull up any of my fight scenes they are brutally fast yeah but it's a fight scene things are going really fast and so there's just this balance that's why I like it's i love the writer's room because we have so many different genre writers in there and so you know in a, in one critique group i'll have like a fantasy reader and i'll have a mystery writer i'm sorry a fantasy writer and a mystery writer and inevitably after the fantasy writer reads the mystery writer were like i don't understand why you have this paragraph in here and i don't understand why you have that paragraph in here just like that's just information you know that doesn't need to be it doesn't move the story because as a mystery writer you're not really developing characters you're not developing a world you're just chasing a mystery you're chasing a what is the solution to this issue and so it's very bereft of a lot of the stuff that we would do in fantasy. And so I always have to go, all right, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute. What that does is that lets me understand this character at this level. And, you know, the mystery writer's like, I don't, yeah, but why do I care? Like, well, you're not an, you're not an epic fantasy fan. Like you, the, the, we are writing to a very specific audience and you're writing it. Cause if, if I wrote a mystery story, <laughs> When I wrote epic fantasy, I would not sell any copies. Um, <laughs> not a single one. <laughs> well, first of all, you'd go to the mystery section and you'd have all these little thin 80,000 word books. And you get this one mystery book that's like three times as thick as a normal one. It's 250,000 words. You'd be like, I'm not. What? What is this war and peace? But it's the same. The funny thing is, it's the same thing as epic fantasy. You go in and you're looking at all the epic fantasy, these big, massive, you know, biblical tomes. And then you see this one little skinny book and you're like, why would I even bother? <laughs> like, why would I buy that? It's like a pamphlet. What is that? You know, 300 pages, 250 pages, please. And, and so this... you just have to understand your audiences. They're very, very different. And this is why people, when people say genre is just a marketing tool, yes, genre was invented as a marketing tool, but it is an important marketing tool for you to understand because your genre tells you who your audience is and that tells you what they expect. And if you are going to break their expectations in a negative way, they're not going to like you. You're going to lose them. <laughs> They have, and I talk about this all the time in my teachings, where I talk about uh, readers have unknown expectations that they don't realize they are demanding you fill. Yeah. And if you do not fill those unknown expectations that they are demanding that you fill without them knowing that they're demanding that, they will 100% leave you. They'll either yeah. not read you again, or they'll leave you bad reviews or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah, is, absolutely. 
it is the way it is. It's just a part of it. Um, I guess I'll do one plug. This yep. book right here that I read a piece from is coming out. I know when's your fourth book coming out? My fourth book will be coming out this year, but you can get one, two, and three, and of course, Magic Four. So right. So this is the first. Um, you know, I've had some health issues. I've been out of the market for a long time. Um, basically everything that I have other than my creative writing books are out of print. Um, and Magic Fall, obviously, Magic Fall is available. But this will be me, back, me getting back into the market. But this book is going to drop in July. If this is something that you liked hearing and would like to keep up with and know when we're rolling things out, we're going to be doing some free um, uh, story connections and, you know, leader magnets and stuff like that. Head on over to starvingwriterstudio.com and uh, just join my mailing list. And then as we start marketing, which we're going to start hopefully in the next three or four weeks, um, and we're doing a whole bunch of stuff and contests and giveaways and all sorts of crazy things. Uh, I encourage you, if this is your thing, if you like if you like what, what you heard, same thing with Marie's. Uh, if you're an American, Starving Writer Studio actually has uh, all of her books. I, we have them in our warehouse here. So we can ship them. Obviously, you can order them from Amazon as well. But I really wish you guys would stop giving Bezos money. He, he's got plenty. Like, why does he need a dollar extra of my money? Give that dollar to the person that you are enjoying their creation. Um, so all of Marie's stuff are here. If you're in the States, uh, this would be, I would recommend that you get it from Starving Writer Studio. But and Amazon. they're signed. They're signed at Starving oh, Writer Studio. That's right. That's right. She, yeah. I she sat around for an entire day almost just signing all the copies that we have in our warehouse. So um, just throwing that out there. Obviously, I'm here in the same town as the warehouse. So I just sign things when I need to sign them. But she's not quite as close. Yeah. So uh, highly recommend that you check that out. Um, and that's the end of my commercial. Oh, I, fully, I fully support all of that. I think you should all buy all our books. Yes. <laughs> They're good stuff. And, and, and you know, if you're into yeah. this this kind if of you're thing. In, if you're into epic fantasy or science fantasy or yeah. Or yeah. well well written stories or well told stories, you know, if that's your thing. All of that stuff. <laughs> and that is a good place to end this episode. And we'll see you for another one. Bye. Good day to our esteemed listeners. I'm Marie Mullaney, and it has been a pleasure guiding you through the nuances of writing and world building. If our podcast has enriched your authorial journey in any way, please consider liking and subscribing. Sharing our content with your peers is a powerful way to support our mission and ensure we continue to deliver insightful and valuable episodes. Your engagement is greatly appreciated. If today's topic sparked your interest, then Just In Time Worlds on YouTube is where you should be heading next. It's a channel dedicated to the art of fantasy world building, infused with real world history and science. As an experienced role player and fantasy author, I bring unique insights that will help you craft more immersive and believable fantasy worlds. From historical tidbits to practical writing advice, Just In Time Worlds is a wealth of knowledge for any fantasy creator or enthusiast. Join us every Tuesday for new and exciting content. If you are ready to take your writing to the next level and work with a group of highly motivated, dedicated writers who are all working to not only improve their writing, but improve your writing, plus you get to work with me on a weekly basis, then I'll encourage you to check out writersroom.us. This is a website that I have created that I really wish I had 30 years ago. It's everything a writer needs to become a better writer. Not only do we do weekly critique sessions, both from other members as well as me, we have daily writing sessions, I do monthly classes, Q&As, we have activities, I do uh, all sorts of learning exercises such as I do a quarterly writing prompt contest and just tons and tons and tons of things. So if you're ready to get serious about your writing and you want to actually finish that novel and have a chance of it being published, 
then I encourage you to head on over to the writer's room and join me there. And as a special promotion for listeners of Releasing Your Inner Dragon, I'll go one step more. If you would like to get 50% off for three months, reach out to me. There's a million ways you can do that. You can do it through StarvingWriterStudio.com, DrakeU.com, any of my social media such as LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, X, whatever. Reach out to me. Say that you would like to check out the writer's room for 50% off, and I will send you a link that will allow you to do just that. So hopefully you're ready to start getting serious about writing, and I'll see you in the writer's room.